So I'm going to be discussing changing ecosystems and the ecology of change. But at the outset, I, and I promised there was no sharing of slides ahead of time. There'll be a little redundancy in my first few slides here. But I would like to say congratulations to the whole Odom School. I mean, um, it's just incredible to think that it's been 50 years already in the making, and here we are today. The Institute, as has been mentioned previously, really was a vision ahead of its time. And the reason that we are where we are is that there has been effective leadership all along the way. As we heard earlier, institutional support from UGA. The Institute wouldn't be where it is without that. And we had tremendously committed faculty, many of whom are here today, who devoted their entire careers and, and grew as scientists at this place. So it's um, a really remarkable accomplishment. So I did just do a little bit of walking down memory lane. All of my pictures are slides or photos, which I have photographed. But the Institute, when I first started, so this is my first year, February 1981. You will notice an absence of vegetation around that building. It's strikingly different. Those of you who were, how many of you were in the Carrolls? Your offices in the Carrolls? A number of you? Right, so this is, these are the Carrolls. This is my side of the building, not the other side where Kim and Bob were. Um, that's my desk. I wish my desk was as clean then, today as it is then. Um, our courtyard, I mean, that was such a wonderful place to read our papers for class. I mean, taking, taking your paper out and sitting out in the courtyard or having potlucks. And then, again, the absence of, whoopsie. Whoop, 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 whoop. Come back, come back. There we go, got to get the pointer right. Um, that's where we used to play volleyball on Fridays and drink beer. So the things have changed again as well. But what I really value so much in my own training and the experience I had here was that we had such leading thinkers present training us as young scientists, as early career scientists, and representing the science of the times. Um, that's my copy of Odom's Ecology book, which I had as an undergraduate. It's why I applied to the University of Georgia as a New Yorker. Going to Georgia was not considered to be the best thing from my family members. It was awesome, however. Um, but we were lucky to have so many people leading in so many areas. I have names here, and if there are any I, I omitted, it's simply by a lack of remembering. It's not by intention. But, I mean, Gene Odom and Frank for ecosystem ecology. Sustainability, a term now that was, that was new then. Um, systems ecology and modeling, Bernie Patton and Dick Wiegert. Long-term research, so Dak, Wayne Swank, Akawita, and Judy. Uh, Biogeochemical cycling, Bruce Haynes, Carl Jordan. Microbial loop, which was new in marine systems and marine ecology, um, Larry Pomeroy, Jim Porter. Aquatic ecology, Judy Meyer, Karen Porter especially. Agroecology was new, Dak and Dave Coleman were leading a lot of that effort. And then landscape ecology, Frank Golly, Vern Mentemeyer in geography, uh, and Ron Pulliam with a lot of his source sink ideas. As was mentioned previously, these areas and these leaders were pioneering in their thinking. They were holistic, they were integrative, and collaborative. Now, not only were they leading thinkers, but they were thoughtful leaders, um, leading us by example. This was mentioned previously, but Georgia has five prior ESA presidents among its faculty. That is the only institution to have that. We grew up as young scientists being trained to contribute back to our discipline, to, to help serve the societies upon which we depend and from which we benefit. Um, Frank was also uh, leading a lot of the international connections uh, by his service as, as president of Intercal. And also, I feel like it's appropriate for me to give a couple of personal notes of gratitude to some of these faculty who influenced me so much in my development. Um, Frank was my mentor. He's my advisor. He was extraordinary as a mentor for a young scientist. And I would not be where I am today. I would not have evolved in my science without that, that training. Susan Bratton, who's pictured here, was uh, the person who taught me field ecology. She was on my committee. She was from the Park Service Co-op Unit. They funded my research as well. But as a female scientist, she, along with Judy and Karen, um, there, were, there were women scientists here. That was unusual. There were few in the ranks of the faculty. So I am greatly appreciative for both Susan on my committee, but the others as well. Gene was on my committee. He also hired me as a postdoc when I had no other offers, but it was also a <laughs> wonderful opportunity. 
Larry Pomeroy accepted me as a student, which many of you may not know. I had done my undergraduate honors thesis on phytoplankton, limitation, limitation of silica on phytoplankton in Long Island Sound. And unfortunately, I learned I didn't want to sit by a microscope, so I got here naively and said, I don't really want to do that. And he was very gracious. <laughs> um, Dak was head of graduate admissions and was really, really just delightful in helping to recruit me. And uh, Bernie Patton, I will call out as well. Um, the course on systems ecology, I don't know how many of you have had Bernie's class in systems, quite a number of you. It was highly influential and really changed um, my thinking in, 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 in a good way. So I'm gonna be talking today though about science and I will be talking about the ecology of change um, I will mention, however, that UGA has continually evolved with the times. After 50 years, it's still at the forefront, addressing many of the contemporary problems we face in ecology. But as has been mentioned um, by Peter and, and others, we're currently in a time of just unprecedented rates of change. And some of the changes that we are observing and, and uh, in, in all of the systems in which we work are big, that is, they're qualitative differences, and they happen really fast. They're abrupt changes. And I think these are often the ones that lead to surprising outcomes where we say, geez, we didn't expect that. And I think it's also one of our biggest challenges in contemporary ecology, regardless of the level of biological organization or the subdiscipline or the scale. So that's gonna be kind of my theme. Again, following up a little bit on the rates of change that um, Peter so nicely set up, this is from Will Steffen's uh, paper, up updating some of the big drivers globally of change. There's socioeconomics on this side, earth system trends on the other. Details don't, aren't critical, but what I'd like to just focus your attention is since 1950, that exponential, that hockey stick curve that you see in so many different drivers. So this is fundamentally changing the way our ecological systems are responding. And I apologize for the, the acronym here ahead of, it, of identifying it, but ACEs, standing for abrupt change in ecological systems, are happening all around us. The more we look for them, the more we see them, and they're continuing to surprise. So whether it's lakes suddenly turning from clear to turbid or eutrophic, or coral reefs that are going from these beautiful, colorful, diverse systems into areas where they're dying, or rangelands, for example, where we're seeing increased uh, densification of woody vegetation and, and bareness on the ground from what had been a, a thriving uh, rangeland system. So abrupt change, when I talk about that, it's things that are abrupt in time or relative to the speed at which the drivers are changing. If you think about some response, a driver or a state, and you think about time, it could be a step function, but it's big and it's happening quickly could be a you know, little bit slightly different sorts of changes, but we're talking about big changes that happen quickly. Oftentimes, these involve tipping points or thresholds where, again, if we have our, our response or our state on the Y and we have some kind of controlling driver on the X, where if you're near that threshold, a very slight change in the value of that driver can cause a really large change in response it may be a threshold, it may also be a hysteretic or, or bifurcation alternative state type dynamic where when you release the driver, you push it back the other way, you can't just get the system to recover quite well. It's very difficult in practice to distinguish those two. And I would say one of our big picture questions in ecology is when, where, and why are these kinds of changes going to be happening in our systems? Can we anticipate them? Can we figure out ways to avoid the ones that we don't want? Can we diagnose them when they happen? So we're actually involved currently in a project that's focusing on this general area across systems, time scales, spatial scales, terrestrial, aquatic, uh, a group of five faculty and a cluster hire of four postdocs. So we've been trying to think through this very generally. And it's really challenging, uh, surprisingly so, actually, once we, once we get into it. So the abrupt changes are hard to diagnose because of uh, several factors. One is they can be caused by many different uh, causes. That didn't make sense. They can arise from many different causes. So we can have really rapid changes in the driver. So the driver changes rapidly and the system responds. 
We can have changes in disturbance regimes, like fires, hurricanes, floods, the types of things that have been very much in the non-fake news this year. We can have stochastic variability, or increased patterns or changes in variance in drivers, even in the absence of a changing mean. In real world systems, we have multiple drivers interacting with each other, changing simultaneously, so it's really hard to disentangle what happens in the end. <laughs> Um, thresholds are particularly thorny because it's really hard to uh, anticipate them before you pass them and see that you go down that slope. And finally, the theory. We have a lot of theory to address these things, but the theory has really outpaced the real world applications. When you try to figure out how do I take some of these ideas that are out there and apply them in the system in which I work. So I'm going to be telling you a story about fire, climate, and forest resilience, and a story about abrupt change. So I just want to put a little context for, when I talk about disturbances and drivers, what I mean. So if we start here, and we have a system or a state or any, any of your, whatever your favorite response might be, we may have disturbance events that happen in time. They happen to be equally spaced here. This is just a cartoon. So they affect the system, the system recovers. They affect the system, the system recovers. This is kind of like the normal state of being that the system is accustomed to. However, there are ways in which the changes in these, these dynamics or their interactions may uh, lead to situations where the system doesn't recover. So maybe the disturbances become so frequent in time that the system can't recover and maybe it, it crashes. Maybe the intensity of the disturbance or the size of the disturbance is increasing over time and again causes a disruption of the disturbance recovery cycle. And then we ha may have changing drivers interacting with disturbances that again can operate to tip the system. So conceptually that's where I'm thinking. But I'm going to take you on a trip to Greater Yellowstone today. So out of Georgia and off to the western US. This is a place that I've worked in for almost 30 years now. It is one of the largest intact wildland ecosystems in the temperate world. It's located in the northwest corner of Wyoming, centered on Yellowstone National Park, surrounded by other parks and uh, wilderness areas. I also want to just acknowledge here briefly that I'll be talking about work that is done in, co in collaboration with my students and colleagues and funded by a variety of different sources. So Yellowstone is really well known to most of you. How many of you have been there? OK, so all of you. How many of you be have been there and remember seeing blackened trees? <coughs> oh, good. OK, so a handful of you. Or I'd say maybe half of you have been. So most, of, most people go out there and they're familiar with the wildlife and the thermal features and the scenery and all of that. Yellowstone is dominated primarily by forests. It's about 80% forested. Most of those forests are middle elevation dominated by lodgepole pine. There are spruce fir forests at the higher elevations that are cooler and wetter. And at the lower elevations that are warmer and drier, we have Douglas fir and aspen. Now, still a little hard to see in here with the lights, but in the summer of 1988, Yellowstone had very, very big wildfires. And these fires were the ones that were on the news every night, much as California has been throughout the fall. At the end, the forests looked like this. And as I like to say, this picture, I took this in October of 88, it is a color picture. <laughs> it's just looking like it's black and white. So it looked like the area was quite devastated. However, we have learned, and I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the foundational work because I need to establish that before talking about some of the change. So I've been studying these fires since 1988, and I'm just going to be, do a little bit of a whirlwind about what we have learned since then and then how we're thinking as we look ahead. So fire is actually not new in the system, and I've had fun reading some of the early reports of the journals of the explorers that were surveying that country for the first time. And in one quotation here from uh, Langford, who ended up being the first superintendent of Yellowstone, they talk about going through breaking camp, traveling along the edge of the Firehole River, passing through a long stretch of fallen timber, blackened by fire for about four miles. So my colleague Bill Romney has done the dendro work and the fire history reconstructions in Yellowstone. And this was likely 
1862 fire that happened right in that area that is reported. So fire has been there even since Euro-American settlement. However, since 1988, we've also learned that infrequent stand-replacing fires, meaning the fire comes through, burns through the canopy of the trees, kills the trees. This is very different than the coastal longleaf pine or loblolly pine types of systems. Um, these kinds of fires are business and as usual. So throughout the past 10,000 years, so throughout the Holocene, fires have recurred at one to 300 year intervals, some variation over time uh, in that system. Importantly, they're driven by climate, not by fuels. So fuels are generally always available, but most summers have climates that are too cool and too wet to burn. So when you get that infrequent summer, like 1988, it makes all the fuel available, and the fire just continues, goes through the landscape, and, and resets the system. So the 1988 fires are notable in the West, actually, and in fire ecology for sort of ushering in the new normal, or the new era of wildfire in the West um, in which we are living now each year. So nonetheless, the size and the severity of the 1988 fires were really <coughs> surprising to scientists and managers alike because we hadn't seen fires that big and, and that severe during the 20th century. Largely, side comment, because the climate was too cool and too wet. We didn't have the burning conditions happen. These fires burned under very severe drought, very high wind, and I always have to mention they were not caused by past fire suppression. This is a different system than the southwestern ponderosa pine or even some of the savanna type settings that we have uh, in the east. And for a budding landscape ecologist, they gave a wonderful opportunity to study a landscape scale creator of pattern that we can't do experimentally. Shown here is the outline of Yellowstone. The red areas are the perimeters of the fires. So they affected about um, a little bit more than a third, almost 40% of Yellowstone. So I got to go up in a helicopter in October of 1988, which was really fun. It was when they were still firefighting, and I was out there trying to figure out what the research would be and what things looked like and get the hypotheses together for an NSF proposal. So I'm going to, again, do a quick run through of some of the main messages from 25 years of work. One is that the fires created a really complex landscape mosaic. We're accustomed to this now. Anytime you have a big disturbance, you know it's going to be heterogeneous. We didn't know that at the time, which sounds kind of silly, but flying over in the helicopter and seeing this kind of pattern where we have different patches of highly, you know, very severely burned areas where all the trees are killed, islands of green trees that are missed by the fires, and then these brown perimeters here where you had the trees killed, but they didn't burn off all the needles. So very complex spatial mosaic, which in turn influenced successional patterns. We also were surprised that the vegetation recovered really rapidly, like much more rapidly than we expected. And if you, the sequence, this is October of 88, this is two years later, you can see the flowering, the robust flowering and the understory vegetation recovering. By 15 years, these are all the little lodgepole pine trees. And they start out by recruiting the very first year after fire, little baby seedlings. Um, but they come in really early. The understory vegetation re-sprouted primarily. And that was also a surprise. So the fires didn't burn down into the soil very deeply, which we were <coughs> surprised at initially. And so in many cases, you can see here, these are lupins. You can see this is a very well-developed root that the plant has re-sprouted from. So we did a lot of excavating at the time. But basically, in 89, the plants re-sprouted. In 1990, two years after fire, they flowered. And in 1991, we had a huge recruitment of seedlings of native flora. So non-native plants did not increase, which was not what we expected based on what was known previously. Um, in general, species richness at a plot level increased for about five years or so. This is from widely dispersed plots around the park. There was a still strong influence of the abiotic template. So the composition was kind of similar initially following the fires, but then it diverged based on the elevation, the topography, the soils, and the like. 
and there was a strong effect of ecological memory. So the species that came back were largely the species that were present before the fire because of all these autogenic mechanisms. The abundance of the lodgepole pines was, um, I would just say, astonishing. So they come back really fast, uh, but the variation was so much more than we ever expected. Everything from a sparse forest coming back, so that's about 500 or so trees per hectare, to over 400,000, actually over 500,000 stems per hectare. I don't know how, if for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that means right now we can't walk through them because they're so dense, they're just extremely densely packed. So this is all the same stand age, uh, coming back after the same event, but very, very big differences in the, in the structure of the ecosystem, largely due to variation in whether the trees bore serotonous cones, those are the kinds of cones that remain closed until they're heated and then they release their seeds. But that trait varies across the landscape in ways that we didn't know. We kind of serendipitously spanned the gradient. And then also this variation in fire severity had an influence on these patterns. <coughs> so when we most recently resampled these at 24 and 25 years after the fire, we still have this variation on the landscape. It's kind of what it looks like. It's um, really challenging sampling conditions right now because the trees are really dense. You can't, you can't run a bearing, you can't sight very far. And all of the pre-fire <coughs> Uh, coarse wood, the standing snags, standing dead, they've all fallen. So you have standing dead up to your nose, trees that you can't see through, and you're trying to swim your way and climb your way through to do your sampling. It's a really good place to send undergraduates or graduate students. <laughs> <laughs> so these, these trees are also really productive. They're actually, um, they're, their net primary productivity is higher than the mature stands at this point. Um, the numbers here that, that are showing for averages, for those of you who know, think of in those terms, are there. But suffice it to say, they're really, really productive. And even in those high density areas where you'd think they'd be out competing each other already, they're not. So the quantity of trees at the ecosystem level trumps the quality of the trees at the tree level. So if you have three or 400,000 trees per hectare, as is shown here, even though each individual tree is smaller than where they're, where they're open grown, at the ecosystem level, <coughs> that is huge amounts of productivity. These patterns of, change, of differences in stand structure set up a pattern across the landscape, a mosaic of process rates. And so this is for 10 years post-fire, the patterns are still similar, but there is variation in the total above ground net primary productivity and we have a mosaic, this is the southern portion of Yellowstone, of process rates that's due to the patterns that were set up following the disturbance. We also know that that mosaic persists for over 150 years. Uh, this is work by one of my former PhD students, Dan Cashin, just showing you that the density of trees per hectare goes down over time. So by the time you're at 200 years following a fire, it's about 1,200 trees per hectare, but this is the coefficient of variation among stands of the same age. So the variation remains high, and then it settles in by about 200. So those initial patterns really set the stage for how the system behaves for a very long time. I also want to talk briefly about <laughs> nitrogen dynamics. I avoided that with with great success while I was a graduate student. I did not do any biogeochemistry, and I got really interested in it in the 1990s because of wondering, what does this mean for the function of these systems? So I started doing it then. But surprisingly, there wasn't very much known about nitrogen cycling following this kind of fire. Almost everything had been done on prescribed uh, low-severity fires. So we did a bunch of stuff on it. And two, two main points. One is that despite what you have learned from the hubbard Brook examples and what we all teach in undergraduate ecology, this system did not lose much nitrogen following the big fires of 1988. We kept thinking our data were wrong, okay, going back, going back, and back, and back again. But the microbial uh, community in the soils is really tight. It's holding on to the nitrogen that's remaining in that system. And we know that from laboratory incubations using pool dilution, 
where the consumption, the, the, the grabbing by the microbes, exceeds what's the net production, and also from field incubations that are year-long resin core incubations. So the microbes in the system really hold on to the nitrogen. By about 15 years, the plants, those rapidly growing lodgepole pines that I showed you, they're really effective at competing with the microbial community in the soil. They're also mycorrhizal. And they become a very strong sink for nitrogen. So they start to sequester it. And then similarly to what I showed you for carbon or for productivity, this variation in tree density that I was showing you <coughs> also sets up a landscape mosaic of foliar and, and, and nitrogen uh, cycling rates. As of 25 years, we still have no evidence that nitrogen is limiting productivity in this system, which is very surprising and counter uh, to what conventional wisdom would be. The foliar nitrogen concentrations are still surprisingly high. Um, there is a negative relationship between productivity and nitrogen availability that's opposite what you would expect if an availability was associated with increased productivity. And over time, all pools of nitrogen in the system have increased. And I will say we have very few. We don't have alder. We don't have, like here you have black locust, a coweta. We don't have a nitrogen fixer that's dominant. So where it's coming from is something we're still working on. So basically, the consequences of those big fires have been very well studied. We've, we've studied them to death. I shouldn't say that because it's a lot of fun to still tra track it. We know the narrative. So this is from National Geographic a year, uh, two years, well, almost two years ago now. We know the narrative. So we have the fires, and then we have the recovery, and then we have the, the forest <coughs> coming back, just like that cycle that I showed you at the beginning. So the bottom line, native vegetation, ecosystem processes recovered rapidly without intervention. Yellowstone is well adapted to these kinds of fires. Thank you very much. Lots of resilience. One of the ways that we depict this in another way, and I'll use this again later, is by these ball and cup diagrams. So if this is my Yellowstone forest, the fires can come around and they, they move that ball around in this basin, but they don't push it out. So the system you know, moves out, but it comes back, moves out and comes back. Um, whether or not it can flip to another state is one of the things that we're starting to think about. So, we know, going back to the issue of change, that both climate and our fire regimes are changing. The paper that Leroy Westerling published in 2006 in Science was the first one to show the statistically significant relationship between climate change in the West and the occurrence of fires. So we were having large, an increased number of large fires, high severity fires in the West, and it's associated with the warming temperatures with the earlier snow melt in the spring and then the lengthening of the fire seasons. So this is all stuff you've been hearing on the news as well, associated with California. Um, Leroy updated this. These bars here are the numbers of fires that are large in the west. By deck, the bars are the decadal means. And you can see them marching steadily up. And that's continuing. So, we started thinking about the effects of climate change in Yellowstone in the late, like really in the 19, early 1990s. So the first paper Bill Rami and I wrote came out in 1991. It's before we had the, the sophisticated climate models or the predictions, nor even really enough data yet to, to say that the trends were clear. So it was really more of a thought exercise about what would happen. And so, you know, we laid out in that, <laughs> that yes, well, a warmer and drier climate would increase fire activity. If we had more fires, it probably would reduce the net age of the stands across the landscapes. And again, it might shift the vegetation upslope just because of the, the cooler conditions at higher elevations. So we did probably over 10 years or so, more than that actually, because to, through 2009, a lot of different modeling approaches where we really kind of, I, you know, I put the hammer here because we really tried to hammer the system based on all the variability that we had seen throughout the records from the Holocene. So what happens if we make the fires as frequent as they were observed and, and the like? So in all of those cases, we know that climate and fire had changed in the past, that it would change in the future. In all cases, when we were doing our modeling explorations, the forests were recovering just fine. So it was very consistent with what we had seen following the 1988 fires. And we knew that those were not catastrophic. 
So again, it did not change the conclusion that Yellowstone is well adapted to these large, severe fires, and it is likely to be in the future. Or is it? So the thing, when I talk about abrupt change, sometimes we have changes in our conceptual understanding as well. And this was a watershed for me. So Leroy and I were at the same conference. And he, he put this map up of the moisture deficit in 1988, the year of the big fires, and the redder, the drier. So that's where it's more arid, where the drought conditions are the worst. And you can see in 1988, it's centered right on Yellowstone. We know what happened then. And then he showed this for the projections for 2090, where it's both more intense and that red throughout the West. That is out of the box. That is beyond what we had considered because it's beyond what we had seen in the Holocene. It goes outside of that range. And although we had been really thinking, we hadn't thought that anything that severe could be in our futures. So it really started changing um, our understanding and our thinking about what might happen. So Leroy and I were able to get, uh, with a couple of other colleagues, some um, joint fire project funding to start looking at what those implications might be. And for the Yellowstone area, uh, this suggested that we'd see spring-summer temperatures up by four to six degrees C. And that's the time period where it matters for fires. Um, by the mid-21st or the, the end of this century, um, the water year deficit is driven not so much by a change in precipitation, but by that warming, which is tending to dry out the system. Um, this is a bit of a complicated figure, and I'll just make a couple of points from it. But we looked at what that would mean with many, like with 10,000 replications and such from, the, from different climate models, looking at the log area of, of area burned on the Y, and then time on the X, the area burned in the 1988 fires is here, and all of the vegetated area of Greater Yellowstone is here. These colors are showing the observations which match well, the median and then the, the whole full range of, of observations over the fires, over the projections. Basically what it says is by mid-century, we're getting very few years with no fire, and the weather conditions associated with big fires are happening essentially all the time. It doesn't say there will be fires. It's based on the weather conditions because there aren't fuel feedbacks here. So the, the, the nugget here is that the novel, the fire regime in the future could be novel relative to the, to the Holocene to the past 10,000 years. And these changes are much greater than what had previously been considered. And we would have few years without fire Fires would no longer be climate limited, so they would, would have the climate available for those big fires all the time, which remember I, I said is, was quite different uh, from the beginning. Eventually, fuels would have to be limiting to the fires, and what would happen to the fire severity remains to be seen. So this has really sent us on a new um, investigation of what might be happening throughout the West. So we know, again, fire activity will increase, but the details about how that will play out remain the subject of very intense research by not only our group, but others. How many fires? How much area will burn? When will these changes happen? Where will we see them? Are there going to be tipping points that lead to fundamental changes in those systems? So this is hard to do because by their nature, these high severity fires are infrequent at any given place. It's not like you can easily go out and get lots of replication. Trees live a long time, and so they can be, there can be very long time lags involved before you see changes. But the fires themselves can potentially trigger an abrupt change in that whole fire and recovery cycle. So what do we do in the face of these challenges? So I would say for this and many of the other big, wicked problems we face, we can't put our heads in the sand and ignore them. We actually need to take advantage of all of the sort of tools in our toolkit. So observations across disturbance characteristics or across space, long-term study where we can look at the dynamics as they change, experiments, and then also process-based models. It's going to be really important, I think, that we try really hard to identify the nonlinearities or the thresholds that might be associated with abrupt change. 
and that we understand the mechanisms or we test hypotheses about the mechanisms that could be underpinning such changes. So we've been doing that in, in the Yellowstone system, asking how does the warming temperature plus the changing fire going to affect the forests in the future? And I'm going to walk you through three different um, mechanistic hypotheses about what might play out. The increase in fire frequency affecting the supply of seeds, the fire size affecting the delivery of seeds into the burned area, and the drought affecting establishment. So first of all, frequency of fire and seed supply. So we have conifers, they're obligate seeders, they have to produce cones, that's the source of the seed that comes in, whether they're serotonous or non serotonous If the reburns occur before the trees have matured, you lose your seed source. And so that could lead to a failure of the ability of the system to recover. <coughs> so following the 1988 fires, it's mostly large trees, big mature trees, long interval fire that set up this variation nonetheless, but still a lot of recovery following the fires. However, we are now starting to see reburns of those areas that burned in 1988. So in 2016, it was not in the news because there were fires burning in the West everywhere else that were more uh, of, of a greater threat. But we had the most area burned in Yellowstone since the 1988 fires. This picture shows the fires of 2016 burning in some of my study areas, the 28-year-old lodgepole pine stand. So we were just out there uh, a year ago sampling with, with rapid funding from NSF. And this is what some of these look like. And again, it's a little bright, so you can still see there is this mosaic, just like I showed you from my helicopter picture. But we also have areas like this, we were calling them stump towns, mm -hmm. because all of the coarse wood and all of the young trees were consumed in some of these places. It was greater severity than we had seen following 88. So in areas, this is, um, I haven't even analyzed the data, this is really the back of the envelope stuff, but in places where we had kind of like the normal stand replacing fire, the trees that came back after the 88 fires, this density is matched by what's coming back after 2016. However, in the areas that look like this, I mean, they're just remarkable. You can see the, these um, lines here, these are ghost logs. So that's where the coarse wood had been on the ground, but it was completely consumed. And you can see there's no, there's no above ground trees. We had to use a stick to poke to try to recreate what the densities were because all that was left was stumps. We have there 99% reduction in the regeneration. So the, these, we've re, we really did lose the seed sources. So in addition to the frequency, this variation in severity is also playing a role, I think, in what will come back. In terms of fire size, if we change the patch sizes, and for species like Douglas fir that do not have a canopy seed bank, then fire size may influence whether or not seeds can disperse into these areas. Um, this is post-88 fire uh, data, but here's surviving Douglas fir trees, and then we have coming down the hillside here, little post-88 ones coming back <coughs> in, but essentially, if you're more than 100 meters from a live tree, a seed source, there's very little regeneration, and especially if you're on a dry position. So patch size will matter. And then drought is associated with the fire, but drought can also affect the ability of the trees to establish and grow following a fire. So if we think about the mature forest, big trees can handle a lot. Little trees, not so much. Just like in your garden, when you're planting flowers or vegetables, you've got to baby them in the beginning. So the uh, tolerance for the mature trees of environmental conditions is much broader than it is for seedlings. So we've been looking. We took advantage, well, again, one of my former PhD students, Brian Harvey. We looked at fires throughout the northern Rockies that were followed by three years of above average temperature, so lower moisture, and then normal or wetter conditions. And we found that, indeed, we see fewer trees in the dry post-fire years, and also on south-facing exposures where it would be, would be drier. So oh, there's evidence for all of these mechanisms coming into play. We're also doing experiments. Um, one of my current students, Winslow Hansen, 
we are in the process of writing up this paper for uh, ecological monographs, but we've done both greenhouse experiments and field transplant experiments where we're growing seeds in post-fire soils of current climate and then in places in the landscape today where the future projected climate is, is apparent today, so at the lower elevations. And those data are also showing that at the low elevations over a four-year field study, we have much reduced success in terms of tree establishment. So we're getting this from, from multiple angles. So my question is then, are we potentially seeing forests in transition where instead of this historical condition that I showed you, we may be making this basin more shallow by warming the climate, and then with the changes in the fire, have the ability to perhaps change the system to a non-forest or deciduous forest state. So what that would look like is do we have Yellowstone transitioning from this landscape, which is what you see now if you're out there, to something that has a whole lot more open type vegetation, maybe an expansion of some of the lower elevation grasslands, expansion of aspen and of Douglas fir. So one of the challenges, even with these kinds of field studies, is we kind of get what we're given by the weather and the conditions that we have. But when we're trying to understand the suite of factors that could affect novel conditions in the future and novel systems, um, it's, it remains challenging. And when we go to use models that exist that are empirically based, they're based on the past, not on the future. So we may be seeing climate conditions and fire regimes that are quite different from what we have seen in the past. And we want to know how multiple interacting drivers can shift us to different, different positions. So therein comes the role for modeling. So we are now using um, a model called ILAND, developed by uh, my collaborator Rupert Seidel, who's in Vienna, which is a process-based model, individual-based model, but scalable, that um, represents trees and landscapes and disturbances and spatial dynamics and such, so I just want to mention what it is. I'm not going to go through the details. One of my students uh, has already parameterized this model for our Yellowstone tree species. This is just showing in the gray lines actual um, simulations from our stands based on the 88 fires in the red dots showing field data that we have from plots, so we have the model behaving well. And then I mentioned these factors we are, would like to look at how they interact with one another. And so we have conducted a factorial experiment with the model looking at several, three, two species, but two forms of one, fire return intervals from the lowest observed in the Holocene to shortest that we've observed in the field, varying distances from seed source, and then climate periods that are the historical mid 21st century and late 21st century and looked at all the combinations of those. And I'll just show you one output here, that's all. Um, this paper is being revised now. We had minor revision for ecology, so hopefully it'll come out later this year. But for each of our species, what I'm showing here is a state space of where in red, post-fire regeneration has failed. And we were very conservative about that. That's less than 50 trees per hectare. So that means you're really, you're not even in a savanna by that point. And then where it's successful as a function of distance to seed source, the return interval of fires, and the climate periods. So you can see the various combinations that give you the possibility for having a non-forest coming in at the end. So um, in all cases, distance to seed source matters a lot. Fire return interval is especially important if you have an aerial seed bank and, and the like. So we're trying to explore what sets of conditions might be there, and then we'll look for where those might happen on the landscape. So the bottom line for this, I think, that affects all of us, no matter what systems that we're working in, is that what we've observed in the past, even the deep past, even if we go back 10,000 years, can inform us about mechanisms, but it may not be enough to help predict the future. In my case, I think forests may be less resilient in the future as we have climate warming and we have changing fire regimes. I always like to make sure that I'm not really sounding like the sayer of doom. Yellowstone is not going to be destroyed. It will still have native species. 
it is still one of the best places on Earth to observe how nature is responding to the changes with minimal human impact um, additional. We will see changes in the age, the type, the extent, and location of forests. And I think by focusing on mechanisms, particularly when we have long-lived species and time lags involved, that may help us with early detection. Um, and again, following my theme here, I think anticipating when, where, and why we're likely to have these big abrupt changes is a, a challenge that I think we should all be considering in our systems. So I'm going to end, this is my last slide here, with a couple of extraneous comments that are geared particularly towards the early career people who are in the room. And I think we have, these are some of the lasting lessons I got as a student here that have helped me, I think, throughout my career, but some of them are, are looking forward a little bit. One is always have good questions. You can push to ask a good question, regardless of the system, regardless if it's applied or basic research or any of that, and follow the things that are really exciting to you. I mean, you should want to get up in the morning and go to work and figure out what you're, whatever the problem is you're working on. So really, really push on the questions. <coughs> um, I think also don't get caught up in having just one, one tool, like you see every, hammer, every problem as a nail because all you have is a hammer. You have the opportunity to hear to learn diverse approaches. Use them and appreciate them in your work. So whether it's experiments, comparisons, long-term data, modeling, remote sensing, the, the list goes on. However, in the world of big data and fancy statistics that some of us have to uh, catch up on and, and learn as we go, retain your close association with the real world system. If you're modeling or doing statistics, your work will be better informed by knowing your system. If you're down in the weeds with your system, you will be also better informed by taking the broader modeling approach. But use them together, but don't lose the connection. And then finally, in the world of fake news, which we live in right now, which is very, very disturbing, um, two things that I think are really important with the advance or the advent of predatory journals and the like strongly support the value of peer-reviewed science. The system is not perfect, but I don't think we have a better one. And then also, get involved in your scientific society. Support the professional organizations that are advocating on behalf of all of us and all of our science. You can see I'm passionate about it. So with that note, I will say thank you very much. Um, I really am honored to have had the chance to attend and talk to you. Thank you.